Okay, good morning again, everyone. Uh, I'm Michael Roberts. I'm the Deputy Chief Scientist of CASIS. I want to welcome you to the, the second session uh, of this year's ISS RDC conference. We're fortunate today to have with us uh, an excellent moderator uh, who I will take a few minutes to introduce and a panel of experts who are actually conducting breakthrough medical research off the planet to benefit those of us who are fortunate enough to be on this planet. And I wanted to make a note that uh, I have some very nice words written to me, so I hope I'm not disappointing those who wrote them, uh, but I'm not gonna read them. 49 years ago and 12 hours ago uh, on, on this date in 1969, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were leaving the surface of the moon to rendezvous with Michael Collins, right? So we're coming up on the 50th anniversary today of having persons on the moon and the voyage that they took, right? The destination was going to the moon, but what we discovered in that voyage was Earth. There were some very iconic photographs of Earth taken by the crew of Apollo 11 and those before them that really gave us the perspective of what Earth looked like. I mention that because the International Space Station is a destination, but what we're discovering is not necessarily how to live on that destination. It's looking back at Earth and looking at us. So we're learning an incredible amount of knowledge, gaining an incredible amount of knowledge in living and working in space and exploring new technologies that benefit medical advances here on Earth simply by utilizing the International Space Station National Lab. And you're gonna hear some examples of that from today's panel. I'd like to introduce our moderator today, Dr. Julie Robinson. Julie has been working in the International Space Station environment for over 20 years and has been instrumental in directing research and technology development projects and bringing those to the International Space Station with projects in mind that not only benefit the goals of NASA and exploration, but have direct benefits for humanity on Earth. And with that, Julie Robinson, thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mike. It's great to be here with all of you today. And what we wanted to do was draw you into a conversation about medical innovation. Uh, working with CASIS and NASA leaders, I, we've brought to the stage today some of, I think, the most innovative scientists and the innovative leaders in looking at medical innovations, what could be done on the space station, and how those things then are applied to various goals and objectives. So rather than have a lot of formal presentations and start showing you scientific charts, we'd really like to draw you into that conversation. And so I'm going to start by having each of our panelists introduce themselves and tell a little bit about why they're here today, what the research that they've been doing is, and, and how that um, influences their thinking about medical innovation. So, Alessandro? Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Alessandro Grattoni. I'm professor and chairman of the Department of Nanomedicine at the Houston Methodist Research Institute. My laboratory has been focused entirely on the development of implantable technology for the control, delivery of therapeutics and cells for the treatment of chronic pathologies. So we are ranging pathologies within HIV, uh, HIV, so infectious diseases, to diabetes, to hormone uh, deficiencies. Um, we are focusing our research on this technology and we believe that the ISS will provide us with enormous opportunities for testing this system. Uh, in particular, we have already flown a few missions. Uh, we have flown uh, three experiments so far, the first of which was investigating the transport physics of particles in microfluidic channels, mimicking what we observe with our nanofluidic system for drug delivery. Second was uh, dedicated to the transport of uh, uh, our molecule from our implantable device in collaboration with Novartis. Uh, for the control delivery of uh, uh, formoterol for the mitigation of muscle atrophy in mice. And the third experiment in collaboration with Jordan Nichols, uh, Texas uh, um, UTMB, we have uh, studied um, recellularization of decellularized lung tissue in microgravity with the idea of understanding better the mechanism of wound healing. So the ISS has been a fundamental uh, infrastructure for us for testing our research. Thank you. Elaine? Good morning, everyone. My name is Elaine horn -Ranny, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Tympanogen. We're a medical technology company that develops 
on Earth, mostly ear, nose, and throat devices, but also some wound healing therapies as well. And so we're using the microgravity environment of the space station to try to develop a wound healing model that we can use to develop uh, new therapeutics. And so as a lot of you know, microgravity simulates a very high stress environment, and so it's a perfect opportunity for us to start looking at how to develop a wound healing model so that we can um, study organisms under high stress. So in order to make some steps toward developing this model, we are looking at how hydrogels form three-dimensional structures and how uh, drugs are transported from these bulk materials and move into diff are released into a um, different medium and studying that drug release behavior. And so this is a lot of characterization of material behavior at the very beginning, and we're hoping that these next flights will help us um, inform the next development steps for our wound healing model. Thank you. And Chia. Good morning, everyone. I'm Shia Su. I am a professor and vice chair for research in the Division of Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery at UCLA, University of California at Los Angeles. And the medical problem we're addressing is osteoporosis, which affects significantly men and women. And in our laboratory, which I share with Dr. King Ting, also from UCLA, is how to deliver systemic NEL1 for the treatment of osteoporosis. And the opportunity afforded by the International Space Station is ideal because it, it has microgravity conditions that accelerate bone loss significantly that literally cannot be replicated on Earth. So it represents a very challenging model of osteoporosis uh, in bone loss. And so we recently flown on Rodent Research 5 and with a lot of help from CASIS, NASA Ames, and uh, Louis Stodiak at Bioserve, we were happy to finish that portion of our studies. And we're currently in the process of analyzing all the data from Rodent Research 5. Thank you. And uh, Brian. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Brian York from Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. Uh, there, our laboratory is focused on understanding metabolic and oncogenic inputs to disease, primarily focusing on diseases of the liver. Uh, our focus on the liver is uh, primarily because it's the custodian of me uh, metabolic homeostasis in the body. It's also the site of primary drug metabolism. Uh, we began our journey um, and were the benefactor of early cases support to do ground-based research to understand circadian inputs to metabolic homeostasis. And that work took us uh, in a new direction using new mathematical tools and models to uncover the fact that in addition to the circadian clock, there's also a circotidal clock uh, that operates on a 12-hour oscillation that has implications for stress responses. And so that created uh, a unique opportunity for us to exploit the International Space Station as a unique environment and stress for which there is no evolutionary pressure. Um, to prepare the system, and so um, we hope to understand how disruptions in circadian and this new circuitidal clock impact metabolic homeostasis uh, in human health. Thanks, Brian. And Jen. Good morning. Uh, Jen Fogarty, uh, Chief Scientist for the Human Research Program. Uh, the Human Research Program is part of NASA. We're charged with reducing the human system risk for exploration. Um, we look at a variety of different risks with respect to the human and also to integrate that data back into vehicle systems. What will it mean for our mission to Mars to provide a medical system and keep the crew healthy throughout that mission and also be aware of the impacts for the rest of their lives? So as the prior speakers have talked about their work, we take evidence from all facets of science and medical technology um, and try to understand what it means to astronauts on these missions and also what it would mean to impact vehicle design. I think if you were here on the last talk uh, to hear the discussion about what it's gonna be like and how different it is than ISS today, but ISS is really the perfect test bed uh, for us to understand the reliability of not only the technology, but the evidence base and how we inform the procedures and how the crew will execute whether it be um, just a checkup to see how they are and the surveillance of how they're changing over time to an acute medical event. And then how would we have uh, divined the ability to prepack all of their needs to address that medical event? So our program really addresses that spectrum. We oversee a group of both intramural and extramural investigators. 
Uh, we use a variety of different funding mechanisms and interactions and partnerships to accomplish those goals. Thanks, and Lucy. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Lucy Lowe. I am the Tissue Chip Program Manager at the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, which is one of the institutes and centers at the National Institutes of Health, or NIH. So tissue chips are also known as organs on chip. They're small bioengineered devices that can model human tissues um, and understand disease pathologies and uh, drug effects in in vitro systems that faithfully recapitulate human systems. So. We have partnered with CASIS to create a program called Chips in Space, where we're sending these organs on chips to the International Space Station. And the reason for that is so that uh, we can try and understand some of the uh, disease pathologies that might be seen in space that are accelerated, seem to be accelerated in space, often seem to show a, a disease or a, an accelerated aging phenotype. And we can model these and investigate these uh, on these in vitro organ chips in very short timelines compared to how we would be able to uh, investigate these on Earth, which could take decades to even manifest in, uh, in a disease phenotype. So uh, we're launching our first chips to space hopefully this November, and uh, we're really excited about this research program. Well, thank you, everybody. So we'll be starting our conversation here shortly. I want to remind everyone in the audience that the way you can ask questions of our panelists is to submit them through the app. You have to select this session, and then there's a, a link inside where you can submit questions. And toward the end, I think we have someone that will help us read off those questions and bring them to our panel. But I'm going to start off with a few questions for our panelists as a whole. So uh, you know, at this conference, we have a lot of people at various stages of a research journey. And one of the questions almost all of those people want to know is, how do you get funding to do this kind of research in space? So let's uh, uh, talk to our four researchers and let each of them tell us a little bit about their funding journey. Alessandra? Right. So um, most of my research has been funded by uh, NIH and the uh, Department of Defense and, and other sources for whatever we do for development of implants for drug delivery on Earth. However, whenever we understood that there was an opportunity for the use of the International Space Station, then we uh, reached out to CASES. Actually, the truth is that CASES reached out to us after we first received a, a little prize, a little seed funding uh, from the Eyeline uh, Prize Award uh, we, in collaboration with RICE uh, Alliance uh, in Houston. And so from this little funding, we started developing our first experiment that was all developed, uh, it was all geared toward the understanding of physics in, in our nanofluidic system. Uh, we were able to fly that experiment rapidly enough, and so we were contacted by cases that provided uh, funding support for running an experiment on a much larger scale that allowed us to go on the International Space Station. So from the moment on, I started working with cases, and I uh, submitted several proposals to cases, uh, some of which were actually funded, and, uh, and the journey has been good so far. Um, I've also... Uh, applied to funding from NASA and uh, the TRI Institute at Baylor, uh, but I have not had any success with that just yet. But uh, again, with, with cases, I received all the support that I needed, and uh, not just from cases, of course, but also the help, the technical help and, uh, from, from NASA, but as well as the help from the implementation partner, uh, which in my three previous missions uh, were supported by BioServe and uh, more recently by ProxOps. Yeah, thanks. Elaine? So our journey has been um, a little more roundabout because we did not start out as a space-focused company. So um, several years ago, when we were still students, we competed at the Rice Business Plan Competition and won NASA's Human Health and Performance Prize. And through NASA, they introduced us to CASIS and because NASA had an interest in the work that we were doing and the implications it could have for um, human research, not just on Earth, but also in space. And so through that connection, we got in touch with CASES to understand what they were looking for in terms of how we could start applying the research that we were already doing and in investigating um, gel-based therapies uh, that we were, you know, we were already developing in our lab. And so we submitted a proposal to CASES and used their guidance to um, create some experiments that were, um, on the whole, in terms of space research, pretty low risk because we were not using organisms at the time. And that was how we got started into this program because it, it really did start kind of echoing what the speakers earlier today were talking about. We didn't know that we were able to 
tap this sort of research. Like we didn't know that we were a, we were allowed to <laughs> participate in space research, and so it ended up being a really um, good journey for us because it brought in you know a, y younger researchers who have more focused on the wound healing side and also on the drug de uh, delivery side as well. And so, um, but it took a lot of guidance from NASA and cases to get to uh, the funding that we have and and to get to our first um, uh, set of flight experiments. Great, Chief. Well, in the lab I share with Dr. King Ting, we've had long-standing funding from various agencies. Our lab is focused on regenerative medicine, tissue engineering, how to grow better bone, cartilage, as well as promote skin wound healing, reduce scar, promote healing in diabetic situations, promote muscle and tendon healing. And we've had long-standing funding from NIH, both through the R01, R21 mechanism, as well as through SBIR grant mechanisms. And we've also had funding from California Institute of Regenerative Medicine, as well as DOD. And, but never in our wildest dreams did we ever think we could work with CASIS and NASA until Dr. Julie Robinson came to UCLA and gave a talk. And, um, and we met afterwards through uh, Dr. Johnny Adams, who is the Vice Chair for Research in Orthopedic Surgery. And he introduced us and said, well, your, your studies on NEL1 and studying osteoporosis, that may be a, uh, something applicable to the International Space Station. And so in our meeting with Dr. Robinson, it was, it was extremely productive. She put us in contact with CASIS right away. And, Things just moved at, it seems very accelerated. Next thing we will, it took a lot of preparation, but, but before you knew it, we were watching our mice launch into space on SpaceX. It was pretty exciting. And then to participate in the live return of the mice. And, um, and so a, a lot of it was just being able to have Dr. Robinson come to our school and, at UCLA and let us know about this opportunity. And so, and since then, we've also, um, because of the CASIS award, we've also then applied for additional, uh, an another R01 funding that was able to support a large part of the ground-based work. And so it was a very good working relationship with CASIS and NIH together to make uh, our project possible. Yeah, and I had a great opportunity last week. I was in, at UCLA and, and got the opportunity to meet one of the graduate students who had come in just at the right time to work on this project. And it's, it's some of you in the audience who have worked with NASA over the years know how amazing it is. The graduate student finished on time with space flight data, which <laughs> is, uh, and that's happening more and more. I'm meeting more graduate students that are doing that. It was a, that was a, just a great thing to see that the access to the space station is really making a difference for that. Brian. So our original research was funded by NIH, and uh, we were tasked with looking at metabolic inputs to uh, disease, uh, especially things like type 2 diabetes, obesity. Um, and once we realized that there was a circadian component to this disease and that our work uh, intersected with that interest, uh, we began exploring other opportunities uh, for how to perturb circadian biology with hopes of unmasking new mechanisms and new drug targets. Um, that's when we became uh, introduced to, to CASIS. Um, and it was really through that partnership, we were, again, one of the first benefactors to uh, be funded for ground-based research by CASIS. And although that originally started out as an interest on circadian biology, we started to take those uh, research tools and resources and began to exploit other opportunities to use um, novel mathematics to look at gene expression data in the context of the liver in a temporal fashion. And that was really the uh, motivating factor that uncovered this circuitidal clock. And um, so it was really Casis' support of our ground-based research that helped us to identify the best scientific question to put on station. And so now that's where our research is moving. The thing I have to, I have to say about um, our CASIS journey is that uh, unlike the NIH, which is sort of a black box for funding, you submit a grant and six months later you find out whether three people liked it or not, the process with CASIS was a little bit more iterative and there was a discussion about what they were looking for, how it could be accomplished, and you got that feedback in real time. And it was able to, you know, to inform the funding process in a very positive way. And so that was, that was refreshing for us, having come from an NIH background to a process that was a little bit more interactive. So. 
Thanks, and, and for Jen and Lucy, what do you guys wish that potential investigators knew about the process for getting funding through your organization? <laughs> um, I, I think we do try to be as transparent as possible, but I get the black box comment. Um, there is stuff that goes on in the background, and some of that is really about federal acquisition. You know, there are rules of procurement, and um, we, be, we have to be respectful of that. But having said that, there's still a, a great deal of communication. I think we've, the HRP side um, uses a couple different mechanisms. One of them is a more traditional NRA, which is like what NIH does, but on a much smaller scale. I mean, our funding capability is, is a bit more limited. Uh, not with respect to, I guess, specific areas, but globally, if you look at the budgets, you know, we're dealing with a more limited amount of money. Um, our groups, actually, we have, uh, they're called elements within the human research program that have particular areas of focus. And this is where you have this dichotomy of having to have some architecture where you can get your work done, where people are in charge of or assign, say, a risk or a topic, but you can't be lose sight of the need to translate across right, that the human is gonna experience these stressors as a whole, but I'm gonna dive down and study a particular area of interest at a given time, but I still have to go back and understand its context in the bigger picture or all the stresses that will occur. Now I'm just saying that because in the elements we're broken down into human factors, behavioral performance, space radiation, human health countermeasures, and exploration medical, medical capability from topic areas. And when those folks write their topics, um, as an applied program, um, this is also an element to understand, we very much are focused on affecting outcomes. Now, I do realize, and all of our scientists realize, you're probably gonna need to know something about mechanism um, to, to be able to affect outcome. But there are areas where you work at a more cause and effect level, and you're gonna have to let some of that detailed information go unknown for a while or ever, because we get the effect we're looking for. And there's lots of trades being made. So when the decisions come out about a particular proposal that come in, one, we do use a peer review process that's as an arm distance. We have um, reviewers that are run by an outside contractor, so we stay an arm's length away. They give us feedbacks on scientifically, you know, how rigorous is this proposal? Will it achieve what it says it does? Um, and it is very much what's considered traditional peer review. We also take that in and do a relevancy review, which goes back to the applied nature of the program. How right is this study for NASA at this time? Is this an investment from a scientific value statement that makes sense to us? Um, and we tried to give feedback to the investigators that aren't funded, but it's, it's not like you were chosen because yours was bad. You know, it's a right time, right place. There's a lot of those factors that go into, you know, who got chosen. The other one, again, to be frank with people, is the limited funding capability. We put out a topic, we could get um, anywhere between 20 to 50 proposals in, depending on the robustness, say, of the investigator base, and we might only be able to fund one or two. So those, when you talk about percentages, we might be at, you know, a 10 percentile funding rate if it's one of 10. Um, but that doesn't mean much to the other nine who didn't get funded. Um, again, there are other opportunities. We run three cycles a year. The topics do shift a little bit. Um, we also have some directed capability. When we get very, very mature with a need, um, we can go out. It's similar to a sole source acquisition type process. There is a high level of justification for why you would direct that work. Um, and we also use other more traditional procurement mechanisms, particularly for working in the technology space. And we're looking to procure a certain technology and say test bed it on station, realizing that we probably have to do, we call it flybridization. How do you either miniaturize it, harden it, or do all the things you need to do it to make it flyable? And we realize we're gonna iterate, because space station, again, is um, a great test bed, but it's not designed for exploration. Maybe the right level of autonomy isn't quite there yet but we wanna create a space within the station to test that aspect of a technology. Uh, fluid dynamics was also mentioned in the last talk, and that's another one that needs some maturation. I think <laughs> Lucy might <laughs> touch on that as something we're gonna learn about when you talk about tissue chips in space. Um, we've also done that with fluid uh, dynamics in different analyzers. Um, so it's, it's been an interesting um, challenge to give people feedback 
because there is that aspect of right time and right place. And, and I think uh, was mentioned in one of our previous conversations, it, it's really that uh, never stop trying. If you've really got a good idea, you got to come back to the table. Uh, I know Katie Coleman talked about when she applied for the astronaut corps, and there's many people who applied, I think the record is like a dozen times. You know, you just keep on having to throw your hat back in the ring. We are sensitive to the amount of work that it takes to write a proposal and, and send it in and wait for the response. Um, so we're sympathetic to that, but it wouldn't be good um, for us to fund a proposal. The other point was, I think there's an interesting capability to negotiate and iterate with our proposers after an acquisition is made, after a proposal is chosen. But there is a limit to which, once something has been proposed and sent through peer review, we can't bring it in and then re-engineer it to be something that it wasn't intended to be. Um, there's a limit to the ability we can renegotiate. So we really try to bring in proposals that are the 90% solution to what we were looking for and do some modification from there. Thanks, Lucy. And, uh, and so speaking from the black box's perspective, um, <laughs> we, again, we understand it's, it's difficult. You, you put a lot of time and energy into creating a proposal, and then you don't hear for many months. But what you don't see is the wheels turning behind. There's a lot of different pressures from a number of different levels, and Jen referred to it in terms of budgets and, and priorities. And so I won't go into those related to NIH specifically, but what I would like to point out is that all of you refer to the fact that your ground-based research was very much funded by NIH. And so we, our mandate at NIH is to do research and fund research that is for human health here on Earth. And so sometimes it can be uh, the, the Chips in Space program was quite unusual because it, it's, it's going to station, but the justifications, and I can talk a bit more about that, the justifications for doing that are very clear because it has clear translational relevance uh, scientifically and technically to things that can go on here on Earth. So from an NIH perspective, I would say I would encourage researchers, as Jen said, to, to keep trying and to, to, to keep throwing your hat into the ring. But Think very carefully about if you want to do research that's space-based, think about what the on-Earth applications are or the research that you could do on Earth that would help formulate really targeted ideas that you can approach HRP or you can approach CASIS or NSF with that will mean that you have data from Earth-based uh, experiments that will help push your research forward on station because NIH might not be able to fund that because we honestly we have very few solicitations that are available for direct uh, space flight because the argument from NIH is well why would we do anything in space when we we have everything here on earth that we need to do because we're trying to help health on earth so I think it's very important to encourage researchers to think very carefully about what they're doing and how their research has relevance to earth-based uh, um, outcomes when you're looking to NIH for funding. Um, NIH and NASA HRP have very different mandates. Jen's talked before about the concept of the, the risk factors that need addressing, whereas NIH is often very much more exploratory. Some of the programs we have, we have the rolling deadlines. There are so many different institutes and centers at the NIH that cover the whole gamut of research. Um, and so the importance there would be uh, speaking, going to the conferences that are relevant to your areas of research, even if you're a, a space biomedical researcher, but you're interested in radiation aspects, go to a cancer conference and find NIH staff at the National Cancer Institute or at different kinds of institutes. Find the program officer who you think would be interested to hear what your research is and talk to them about how you might apply for NIH funding because Program officers, I know that researchers hate them because they might not reply to their emails or they might talk them through their reviews that didn't get funded and, and they, researchers want to understand why their, their project, which was amazing and it didn't get funded, and again, it might come down to pay lines and priorities or something that one of the reviewers said, but your program officer is going to be your biggest champion and your program officer will also help direct you to study sections and to different funding mechanisms. And so when opportunities do arise for space flight, like with the NCATS Chips in Space program, Program, then you already have an insider who can potentially direct you in the right direction. So I guess, I guess there's no real easy way to say it because we'd love to be able to fund all the good research that comes in through outdoors, but we just can't. There isn't enough money and there isn't enough um, space. And certainly when it comes to, to 
to station, there's not physically enough space. So, um, so I, I kind of, I want to apologize, but I also want to say that we actually help form the foundations that can then be used as the, literally the launch point for some of the station's research. Yeah, thanks. Let's pull a little bit deeper on, on something that Lucy was really talking about, this, uh, you know, the utility of doing research in space for therapeutics back here on Earth. So, uh, you know, Chia, what do you think about that? Because really, you're really working on a therapeutic, but you're having challenges as well. The, well, in terms of the microgravity conditions, as I talked about earlier, that is, well, osteoporosis is a huge problem, loss of bone, bone mass that affects um, one in three women over the age of 50 will get an osteoporotic fracture, one in five men over the age of 50 you know, throughout their lifetime. So it's a huge, huge problem on Earth. And but what is really remarkable about the International Space Station is that this whole process of bone loss is significantly accelerated in microgravity. And so as an average number on Earth, maybe over the age of 50, you'll lose about half percent of bone mass per year. But in microgravity conditions, if you don't exercise or do any other, other extraordinary uh, measures, the astronauts can lose up to a 1.5% per month of bone mass. And so it's a tremendously accelerated model of bone loss. And so the ISS represented a perfect opportunity to test our NEL1 osteoinductive molecule. Uh, but also, given the, the challenges of the, because the astronauts have limited time, the whole process of being able to conduct experiments on the space station actually, I think, made our overall therapeutic development much more rigorous. Because originally on Earth, we were testing administration maybe every two days or up to every week. But given the constraints on the astronauts' time, we had to develop a formulation that would work every two weeks. And so before we were injecting it intravenously into mice, and, and that would be very hard in, in the microgravity condition and all of that. So then we went from studying other routes of administration, such as subcutaneous and intraperitoneal, something that would be easier. And working with Dr. Ben Wu in bioengineering at UCLA, we were able to chemically modify the NEL1 molecule so that it could be delivered instead of every couple of days, every two weeks, so it would last longer in the bloodstream, and also target it towards bone tissues, so that as it circulated, it would more specifically go to bone. And so just being on, being a part of the whole ISS and CASES project made our, I guess, elevated our, our whole NEL1 project in terms of systemic delivery for osteoporosis to make it even much more feasible and translatable to the clinic. And one thing that's really interesting is that now the, the research in bone being done on the space station is almost all focused on the ground because from an astronaut health perspective, the issue is relatively solved. We understand enough about the mechanisms to send crew members forward. Do you want to talk about that a little bit, Jen? Sure. Yeah, I think the, the information there is very mature. And this is one where sitting in on different um, technical interchange meetings, you will hear people dive down into some nuances of cell level behavior um, that may not be 100% figured out. But, but the end is, when you look at the pre to post testing we do using DEXA, you really see astronauts retaining um, the majority of their bone. And you say the caveat for a second, because there are some compartments that are different than others. Um, but the idea is when you can provide robust enough resistive exercise and proper nutrition, um, we really do have a good result coming out. And, and those types of um, countermeasures, as we call them, that information, part of our group and the, the larger Human Health and Performance Directorate, is about translating that kind of evidence base into requirements for future vehicles, that if you're going to send humans on a mission to Mars or they're going to be living out in a cislunar space for long periods of time in unmitigated microgravity, meaning that we're not going to restore gravity to the vehicle, you're going to have to load them in some way, shape, or form to keep their bones and muscles healthy. And how much, what does that prescription look like? Um, the other thing that I think is interesting that Chu mentioned, which I think I'd like to sensitize people to is when you see numbers being put out there, even in peer review journal publications, when they talk about a rate loss per month, that is a calculation. 
And I talk about this in particular because it's very tangible. But when we measure bone loss, we use, again, a tool called DEXA, which is only available pre and post for the human. They do have a small one up there for the rodents, which I think is very interesting because time course is a very important thing to understand. But in our world, when you do the human work, you're going to have to get creative about how you acquire that time course-like data. Um, because we're not going to have a DEXA capable of measuring human bone density on something like the International Space Station or a future vehicle. Just like we're not going to have a CAT scanner, we're not going to have an MRI, and that's where we go down the route of alternate ways of getting insight into the body in a non-invasive way that is a very different need for NASA than, say, for terrestrial medicine. And we can kind of play off each other. We can actually do improvements to the ground because we, you know, for us, necessity is the mother of invention. We're going to have to figure out a different way to achieve this and be a big driver, which can be a step function change, not only for us, but for terrestrial medicine, because we have implications with respect to our requirements that impact home health care, remote medicine, um, exploratory, uh, exploratory me uh, medicine, exploration medicine for people who want to dive you know, deep in the ocean or people who want to climb another mountain and go remote places. Um, but the bone one to me is very interesting because the loss clearly is negative and it's clearly negative in particular regions of the body that are used to being heavily loaded such as the, the pelvis uh, and the femur where you carry a lot of your body weight when you're in gravity and that goes away in microgravity clearly. Your body is adapting to that. It's not gonna keep what it doesn't need so it starts to shed that bone. But when you look at that negative relationship right now, it's only pre to post and you're allowed to draw that curve almost any way you'd like between them because we really don't know the slope of the curve. And that can become critical because the question and why we did the one-year mission and continue to advocate for one-year missions, when you look at a Mars duration exploration class mission from an exposure standpoint, is that is a six or a 12-month mission different than three months? Because if it's all front-loaded with respect to bone and then you come to some new homeostatic relationship, maybe that big driver goes away. You also worry about bimodal responses. Do you reach another threshold later in the mission where you have another steep drop because physiologically you've reached another threshold or set point where your body says, oh, now I'm gonna do this other thing and compensate in a different way. So I think the bone one from an astronaut perspective for a six month mission is well understood. We know what we need to provide the crew. Some more questions start to open up when you start talking about going 12, 18, 36 months of microgravity exposure that says, do you need some type of pharmaceutical or therapeutic intervention that is gonna keep their bones healthy? Because in microgravity, they will be safe, meaning that you're not gonna reload them in microgravity other than their exercise protocol, which you do have to be mindful of. But that return to gravity, whether it be three eighths on Mars or one G on Earth, can, is going to be fast and it's going to be radical for the body to experience and that's where the injury risk is. That's where the fracture risk is. And he says, we're trying to manage risk across a mission duration but have very punctate areas within a mission that says suddenly the risk escalates a lot and I had to use the entire mission or we had to use the entire mission duration to prepare for that acute risk. So we do a lot of those risk comparisons back to our discussion about funding and priorities that says when you map them out together on something like a le likelihood by consequence scale that says where do these things compare to each other and how much risk in the intervention are we able to take to then mitigate another risk that's downstream. So there's a lot of balancing that goes on and really evidence-based and knowledge is key about making those decisions and the transparency about how we use the information from our investigators that says maybe this mechanism is important but I need to bookkeep it over here because I can't get back to it right now because I have to solve this other problem that's prime. So that's why you see a lot of shifting in our decisions about our funding profile that says some things have moved forward such as um, the space associated neuroocular syndrome. And the reason I had to pause was we, it had a prior name recently <laughs> and we're shifting to that terminology. Um, and that's really about changes in what's going on in the astronaut eye and brain which have put itself front and center, says we need to understand this one because bone is in a safe place from an astronaut perspective right now, but that may come back to us when we have a mission where a Mars landing or a much more uh, extended duration exposure to microgravity occurs because you're not only dealing with the immediate risk at landing, which could be fracture uh, and injury, but the long-term health implications of having your bone architecture altered forever. 
So Brian, you've been thinking about time courses a lot and are, are in the planning stages of a very unique and new experimental design that no one's ever done before. You want to talk a little bit about time course there? Yeah, so we, uh, again, our research started with an emphasis on circadian biology and the realization that um, you know, we have all these tools to try to keep us on schedule here. Um, but in space, there's a, an accelerator to circadian disruption, and that is the exposure to microgravity. And no one really understands that interplay, and so we began doing ground-based research to try to tackle that problem at a mechanistic level with hopes that we would identify players that would allow us to either re-entrain the clock or prevent its perturbation in the first place. And that work really took us uh, in some strange directions, and we had partnerships with uh, signal processing engineers and mathematicians and try to take a completely different look at analyzing this problem of circadian biology. And we applied some new tools and actually uncovered that in addition to this well-established 24-hour circadian rhythm, that there is a 12-hour clock that uh, exists from crustaceans all the way up to higher order mammals such as ourselves. And so once we recognized that this new circuit tidal clock was actually important for controlling the cell's ability to respond to stress, um, that really opened the door for using the space station as a novel stress accelerator to begin to expose um, how the system adapts to stress, what the players are, and how, again, we can use that information um, to implement countermeasures. And so the way that we had to approach structuring our experiment is uh, we want to take mice, put them on station, uh, and train them in a 12-hour light-dark cycle, which is their customary uh, husbandry conditions, then put these mice in constant darkness, which is called free-running conditions. So the, the mice are then on their own circadian clock. There's no external cue of food or light that's driving their biology. And then every two hours over a 24-hour period, harvest tissues from these mice for the purposes of bringing them back and applying unbiased omic tools to understand how gene expression, metabolite differences, protein dynamics, these sorts of things influence the ability of the organism to remain entrained and healthy as a response of their circadian behavior or their circuitidal behavior, as we've now discovered. So um, we've got some challenges ahead of us uh, for figuring out how to actually implement that on station. But I think the temporal aspects of the study are going to shed some light on uh, responses temporally in that environment that we've not been privy to uh, up until now. Well, let, let's go back and talk a little more about therapeutics, because we've got two scientists here who are really looking at drug delivery. And I, I would say that was a less expected direction for space research to go, I think, 20 years ago than it's turned out to be. So um, you know, what, do you, what do you see as the challenges and the innovative opportunity from the space station, Alessandro? Well, uh, in the context of drug delivery, of course, there's enormous potential. Uh, you both have been talking about drug delivery in a circadian, uh, following uh, kind of chronobiology type of uh, profiles, as well as uh, sustaining the delivery over time. Uh, for extended uh, period of time. And uh, this is exactly what we are developing, and uh, we have developed this in support, with, with, uh, with Casey's support. Uh, in particular, again, we, we have developed our first technology for control administration of therapeutics that uh, allows to deliver drugs for extended period of time, ranging from months all the way to years. We are applying then in, in many different areas. Again, HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis is one of them, for which we are actually getting closer to clinical trial in collaboration with Gilead Sciences. So we have already gone through the non-human primate trials. Uh, we tested that same technology with, together with Novartis for the, um, the rodent research experiment that we had just performed, and it was uh, recently concluded, where we were testing it with Formotero for abrogating um, muscle atrophy. So we, we were delivering for two months in a constant fashion Formotero out of these tiny little implants. Uh, but also cases has supported us uh, in the development of these remotely controlled drug delivery implants that could be very uh, meaningful in the context of delivering chronotherapeutics because it's a technology that can be 
pre-programmed to deliver drugs at different times during the day, or it can be remotely controlled. Matter of fact, we have one of the next experiment uh, involves the flying one of these devices inserted in mice and, and tune the release from here, from ground, tune it into the, into the animals. So that also from a feasibility standpoint for animal research, both here down here on Earth, as well as the International Space Station, having a device that allow you to tune, modulating up and down the drug release at any time that you want, that would be pretty beneficial. So we, we really believe the International Space Station offers uh, enormous possibilities, and it's a driver for the development of new technologies. Of course, also going to long-term mission, going to Mars, um, while I, I fully understand that, the, for example, the problem of osteoporosis has been somewhat tackled, uh, again, there is a need maybe for longer terms, uh, flight, flight uh, experiments, uh, but also mission with astronauts going at for, for several months in microgravity. Maybe pharmacological intervention could also be an option, and then the, you would need a delivery strategy for the drug. So this is also enters in the context of precision medicine. In precision medicine, you tend to talk primarily about getting the right medication to the right patients based on all a number of different types of information. But in my context, precision medicine involves also delivering the drugs at the right time and in the right uh, location in the body. And this is what uh, kind of, it's one of the focus of nanotechnology in general, and in my laboratory in particular for nanofluidics again. One of the great things about doing research on station is that there are a lot of projects you can work on that have not been done before. And so that was one of the motivations for looking at how uh, these gels that we make are forming their three-dimensional structures in microgravity and how bulk release of the drugs that we're studying changes in microgravity as well. And so the research that we're doing is built upon you know, a lot of research that probably some of the uh, PIs in the room have already done in terms of the protein crystallization, looking how that changes in microgravity, and of course some of the drug delivery um, studies as well. And so one thing that's really exciting for us is that we get to look at, uh, through our, our fly experiments, since we're only looking at how microgravity affects the structure of these gels and the uh, bulk release of these drugs, we get to look at very basic material behavior. And we want, the, what, the goal for us is to start toward the development of a wound healing model by starting out with understanding these uh, material behaviors. But the data that we're collecting will just contribute to the overall knowledge base that other investors can use in the future as well. And so that's one thing that's driving us um, for this project is not just you know to meet our own goals in terms of trying to develop a better wound healing model for use in microgravity, but also inspire other investigators to use the data that we collect to um, use it in ways that we had never expected. So I'd like to pick up on the precision medicine thread that Alejandro brought up. Um, you know, definitely, I think we're on the cusp, all of us, every single one of us is gonna care a lot about precision medicine more and more as, as time goes on. And, and for those of you who maybe aren't tuned into that term, you know, it's, it's really the ability for healthcare providers to tailor their treatment strategies and their prevention strategies to a given individual's genetic makeup and, and potentially their health history and their lifestyle and their diet as well, so that the treatment matches and, and is most effective for the person. So that revolution is affecting the way that we look at disease in all aspects of, of research on Earth. It's also affecting the way we look at astronauts. So uh, what are, are some of your thoughts about how precision medicine uh, becomes a reality and, and relates to the innovations that we're doing on the space station? Well, as I mentioned before, uh, again, my, in my view of precision medicine, um, of course, the, the aspect, the timing aspect is very much key. Uh, there are many pathologies down here on Earth, rheumatoid arthritis, hypertension, that of course uh, have been shown to be responsive to different type of treatment uh, if the drug is, is dosed at the precise time during the day or during the night. And that's what has, uh, has been driving our developments of implantable drug delivery. But of course, uh, all we're trying to do uh, with you know, this, this uh, sophisticated implantable drug delivery system or using cells that can obviously use their own internal mechanism to regulate the release or secretion of any particular therapeutic molecules according to needs. Uh, that is, of course, is up and coming, and I believe it's, uh, it's very much in line with the concept of precision medicine. Yeah. Other thoughts? 
we don't really, you don't really think touch about that. precision yeah. medicine oh, right now. <laughs> but Chia, Chia, what are you thinking about how precision medicine, you know, are you starting to think about different kinds of patients responding to different kinds of therapeutics? I think that would be true in general for most of medicine in the sense, or just going very specifically in the field of osteoporosis, it's a very open question. Like if someone comes in with osteoporosis, what sort of medication do you put them on? And once you put them on it, for how long? And then when do you take them off? And that's, that's a very basic question for all of this. And I think a lot of that won't necessarily get answered until we understand how each person is genetically different. So not everybody will get osteoporosis. Why is that? Part of it is genetic, part of it is lifestyle, environment. And so as we get to understand it better, we'll probably understand better what type of anti-osteoporosis medicine will work better. Will this person benefit more from a medication that inhibits osteoclast? Or would this person benefit more from something like uh, an anabolic and so and then but also the whole question of how long to treat that person for these are all very open questions in the field of osteoporosis and and right now it is a black box in a way because we don't understand how to deliver and, and how, what best medicine what medicine to best deliver to what type of patients for how long and as we understand this better it will get much more precise Right. We were talking this morning at breakfast about you know the limited number of patient samples that are derived from astronauts, and that you know each one of them is an n of one occurrence. And how do you improve that person's health? Well, no one model is going to be sufficient to allow you to answer those types of questions. And so I think it's this marriage between uh, human-based research and basic science that affords. Um, an opportunity for you to use information that you gain in the basic science sector and apply that information to your end of one case of, of humans, whether it be you as the patient in the doctor's office or you as the astronaut on the space station. And so, you know, I, I think one of the things that's emerged from this discussion is that we all take a different approach to understanding uh, inputs to human health and whether it be drug delivery or drug uh, discovery or um, defining new targets for drugs, uh, all of those fit into um, the goal of ultimately understanding your disease, right? Because we could all have type 2 diabetes, but your manifestation of the disease is very different than mine uh, or very different than, than another person's. And understanding how biology works on a threshold effect and how compensatory mechanisms give rise uh, to the manifestation of disease uh, it really affords us the ability to target one's uh, disease, whatever it is, uh, so that um, we have the best chance of affecting a change and a positive one for that person. Jennifer, how do you see precision medicine affecting astronaut health? Yeah, so this has um, been front and center for us. One, the comment about the discussion this morning was, you know, we look at the total number of people flown in space in the, the US OS side, including shuttle, is like at 520 some odd people, and it's about 525 ends of one. You know, um, they've all, it, to choose comment, it is a combination of your genetics and lifestyle and then other exposures that ultimately manifest different outcomes. And we've had very different outcomes given very similar exposures, which starts to lead you to believe that the, the discriminator was on a genetic level, um, something very intrinsic to the individual that you could put them in the same environment and have very different responses. It could also be how they were prepared um, kind of what did they do going in to the exposure that maybe led to better outcomes. So I think you can use precision medicine and its um, maturation in a lot of different ways. But again, there are a lot of balances that you're trying to work with where you invest um, versus where you're just going to be a recipient of kind of the knowledge base and evidence base that's growing terrestrial, terrestrially via NIH, NSF, um, you know, the American Diabetes Association, the American Heart Association, all those out there funding, trying to understand that role of what is intrinsically important to know about the individual that then allows um, the physician to treat them on a very specific level to have the best outcome for that person. And where is it still that some of the generalities just work? You know, um, it's interesting to see. So we have, you know, trying to 
interpret the evidence base and the new information that's coming along with all of the variety of omics data, whether it be genomics data or proteomics data or metabolomics, and I've heard physiomics, and <laughs> they're adding omics on to just about everything. But you know, where do those things become meaningful discriminators? So there, you have to have some really powerful tools. This is where I think you get into some big data um, when you're dealing with large populations. When you then go into a small subset of, of individuals, you might lose the power of what those things used to mean. And you say, okay, well, now we go back to the individual. The other uh, constraint we have is this vehicle needs to be built, needs to be designed, and you have to have your evidence base ready and written in documentation to translate it to vehicle designers, engineers, who say, well, what does it mean to have to carry an analyzer that does surveillance so you understand you know, a given biomarker at a certain time, and then you had to pre determine again what pharmaceutical intervention had to be present so that individual got what they, they need. And so kind of the resource constraints definitely play into how much we'll be actually able to implement. Uh, we're definitely trying to be smart about, about it and you know, pull the evidence base together and at least get it in a place where we can inform the decision making. But it's gonna be quite the process to see how the data evolves over the next couple of decades. I think we're also mindful that um, there are things intrinsic to vehicle design that we're going to have to lock down sooner rather than later with respect to some of the upcoming missions. But then there's an element of modularity. Um, what can be brought with you? What can change over time and evolve and be responsive to the new evidence base? And, and how, do we, how do we allow for that and we allow for improvement? And, and tissue chips offer incredible mm -hmm. opportunities in precision medicine, so. Yeah, yeah exactly. So um, precision medicine is a big deal at NIH right now. We have the All of Us initiative, which is the big push uh, for precision medicine efforts funded by NIH. But just talking about tissue chips, like you say, it's an incredible opportunity to create a U on a chip. Um, we're interested in developing these tools to be able to look at patient stratification, different subgroups of patients, different demographics, different genders, different ages. Taking that further, like I said, the ability to be able to use uh, induced pluripotent stem cell derived sources from say a skin biopsy to be able to create a number of different tissue types and organ systems from your own skin cells, your own tissues, and then extending that, looking at the possibility of uh, creating astronauts on a chip potentially to be able to be flown at the same time or for the same duration that the astronauts have actually been in a microgravity environment. So then really being able to pin down the exact mechanisms of what is happening to different organ systems and to different tissues, and also how different drugs and therapeutics can potentially prevent or reverse those microgravity associated changes. So there's huge utility, not, uh, not just here on Earth, but also in space in terms of using these tissue chips. And so one of the reasons that we uh, partnered with CASIS to actually send these chips to station is not just because of the fact that we can utilize microgravity to really recreate some of these disease pathologies that we see here on Earth, but also because tissue chips right now, they might be very small bioengineered micro devices, as we call them, about the size of a USB stick, but they might need something the size of a, your kitchen refrigerator to actually be able to supply the computing needs and all the fluids and the pumps and the, the incubators and the refrigerators. And so we've been pushing our teams to actually create systems that you can't send something that size to support one chip up to station because NASA just wouldn't allow it. So we've had to push our teams to adapt their systems, working with the implementation partners here and doing an amazing job of taking something that was the size of your refrigerator and turning it into the size of a shoebox and making it something that's very automated and something that's very plug and play. And that in turn is gonna translate back down to the enhanced utility of tissue chips on Earth so that we can start doing precision medicine efforts with this technology because it'll be very much off the shelf technology that can be bought, shipped to a laboratory and the undergrad who is in for a summer project might be able to start using this technology to start uh, doing much uh, higher scale or larger numbers of experiments with different kinds of tissues, different numbers of participants. So one of the, the, the big um, payouts that we see from, from using Station to do this research is not only the scientific side, but also the technical side. And all of that is going to feed into some of these precision medicine outcomes that we'd like to see from the technology. Thank you. So I'm going to take a risk now and find out if there's some magical person out there in the audience that has the questions you've perhaps been submitting. I think they might have a mic. Is there someone 
with the questions to read off? If not, I've got more. Hello? Hello? Oh, okay. Hey, Julie. Hey, there you are. All right, yeah, we've got a good set of questions here, some very broad, some more specific. Um, what medical innovation is required to identify early signs of health issues during space missions? Okay. So what tech, uh, can we get a repeat? Could you, could you read that a little louder? We're having trouble hearing you up here. What medical innovation is required to identify early signs of health issues during space missions? What medical innovation? So I, I think what is being referred to there is like biomarker. And when we talk about biomarker in the broadest sense possible, so it could be something found in blood, urine, on an imaging scan, what is it you're gonna, what is that um, signal that something is shifting in a person from healthy to subclinical, unhealthy, leading toward a really bad outcome? Uh, we have some that we know every day that are used commonly in medicine. You know, they're gonna manage your blood pressure. I think hypertension was mentioned before. It's not a good thing to let blood pressure go unchecked higher than 120 over 80. It's not good to have a resting heart rate you know, regularly above 65 beats per minute. Um, you all know probably where you should keep your cholesterol in a certain box. You know, how much higher do you want HDL? How much lower do you want LDL? And then there are questions about, um, you know, some of the markers that are coming forward that say when there's a change, it's starting to lead toward a bad outcome. It's not 100% certainty, but these are risk factors you should keep in a certain frame, and this is where precision medicine actually comes in, because a lot of times there isn't an absolute number that could be very meaningful, but it's a delta for the individual. A lot of them are coming out when you hear people want to talk about um, looking for prostate antigen, um, that you know there used to be a cutoff number. Well, people were coming out with prostate cancer at numbers lower than predicted. Why was it? What was that person's normal? And it was a rate of change that mattered. So. There's a lot of things about biomarkers that we're not clear about how you interpret them. There's so many in the mix when you look at literature coming out and it is almost impossible to keep up with the literature. <laughs> Even if you're in your own field, but when you know, you're trying to do space flight medicine and you're supposed to cover all of medicine, all of our scientists are really struggling. This is where you use other tools, analytic tools to keep up and say, I need something to go crawl what's coming out to, to shine the light on or throw the flag up. And I think that was mentioned earlier in a discussion that you know, you hear something, you go to these conferences, you're like, oh, I never thought about X, Y, or Z biomarker being relevant to us. But if it's preceding, you know, saying something is gonna come on imminently, how do we get that back in the box? And that's really key, I think, philosophically to managing risk properly for the astronauts as well as in terrestrial medicine and home health care that you would really like to do prevention, real preventive medicine, which is understand what is your healthy state, what does your constitution look like, and then how do you start to deviate from that and it be a negative way. The other thing um, just to mention is that you, in space flight, and this is a double negative on purpose, you can't accept no change. Right? The human body will adapt. It's an amazing, amazing um, piece of machinery, biological machinery, that will adapt to its new uh, environment. And you have to let it to some degree. It's very disruptive if you try to stop all adaptation, but there is a place at which adaptation can become maladaptive. And sometimes it's situational. I mentioned before, kind of in my comment about bone, that. You know, if you were just going to live in microgravity and were not going to be loaded, there probably is no real risk of having less bone density and changes to your architecture. The risk comes when you reload and you're exposed to certain forces. And so you say, okay, now I have to kind of toggle between these situations and understand how we do prevention and interfere only when it really becomes we're going toward a negative outcome. So the biomarkers are so interesting to us, but it, it is right now, it's kind of the wild west of biomarkers, um, and they're coming in from all angles, and some are in early discovery phases and look very promising. And some of this is about time. Um, we also talked about you need runtime. You need runtime from an engineering perspective on your technology. We need runtime on our science data. And I think uh, earlier, you know, during Adam, Adam Savage's thing, science is messy. 
You know, for a long time, something will stand up and be a fact and be a truth, and then all of a sudden it will tumble. You know, we'll find out that wasn't exactly right or there was a different way to look at it. And from a NASA perspective, we're going to stick kind of with the tried and true. So the most cutting edge isn't something we're going to jump on and implement right away. We're going to have to let it get some runtime. It won't mean that from a research perspective, we won't start trying it out. But I also, and probably not in this panel, get into transitioning it to the operational side. That's, that's not a trivial jump. And there's a lot of that valley of death. So from a biomarker perspective, um, we are just doing surveillance of biomarkers at this point to understand what's really going to become a good signal in a very noisy environment that is an actionable piece of information that we're then going to integrate into a medical architecture. So Ken, we've got about one more question, I think, by the timekeeper I'm getting. Do you have a, a, a good question to offer the panel as a closer, or do you want me to put one forward myself? Let me see here for, uh, well, there's, there's a couple of questions where you can close out on your own. One is how competitive is it to be able to get research proposals accepted for on, on station work? And the other is, is, is uh, throwing us at NASA under the butt. What can NASA do to make your research more effective? Okay. So how competitive and what can NASA do? Maybe let's do a quick firing line across the panel. Let everyone get one last word in. Alessandro? Well, from my experience, uh, uh, I guess NIH funding are the most competitive, and of course NIH funding to go on the ISS, I think even more so, although I have not tried just yet. Uh, but with cases funding, I had a very good, uh, uh, really, experience, uh, really, with, with this kind of interactive uh, manner of reviewing, of course, the research, but also providing comments and, and being able to go back and forth and to finalize finalize the application in a way that it's, uh, it's really meaningful. Um, I think it's, it's really a good way of handling funding proposal, and I really appreciate this from, from cases. Um, I don't have other much experience with NASA because also, similarly to the NIH, uh, the few times that I have applied, not receiving, not being able to receive real um, comments that would help me develop my proposal further. So again, my, most of my funding for, for ISS research come from, from cases. Really? Uh, for us, with our funding from cases, we made sure that there was a very clear connection between the work they were doing on station and how that was relevant back to uh, humanity on Earth. And so with this wound healing model, we're looking at wound healing in particular because you know, if you have um, humans in combat situations, they're undergoing a lot of stress, and if they're wounded, you need to know how to uh, treat them a little bit better. And so in our proposal, we were very clear on describing what the connection was between the space research and the ground research, and how that implications for you know, both um, space and Earth. And so I think drawing that very distinct connection helped us a lot, because we did it very early on, and that made the conversations with cases go a lot smoother. Okay. Competition, or what NASA, what you wish NASA would do? Um, we haven't directly dealt with NASA in terms of grant funding, but with CASES it was a very collaborative process in terms of they let us know what they wanted and we then applied for the grant and then it went through uh, independent review, but it, it was much more back and forth. So it's competitive for certain. Um, there's lots of people with great ideas. Um, I think we often look at these funding agencies as simply the supplier of the money but that's not really their goal. Their goal is to provide the framework for the right question. You said something earlier about choosing the 90% solution, right? And so I think as funding agencies become more focused as to the problems that they need solved, we as researchers are better equipped to say, well, actually I have an idea that might be a solution to this problem. And then you can tailor your research to their problem. And, oh, and they also have the money, so. Lucy, what do you wish NASA would do? Um, so I think all of the researchers said really good things, which is uh, tailor your research to the, uh, the, the point that the funding body is trying to make, whether that's NASA or CASIS or, or NIH. Uh, and my final point for NASA would just be come work with us. Throw money into the ring, throw ideas into the ring. Um, be collaborative. Certainly at NCATS, everything we do is extremely collaborative. Uh, by leveraging the resources of the different agencies, then the, the whole research that can come out can be much greater than the sum of its parts. And do you think it's competitive, both you and Jen? How do you yeah. see that competition? Yeah. 
Due to the constrained resources, there's yeah. no doubt it's competitive. I think um, we can continue to do a better job about articulating what it is we need. Sometimes we try to step back and say, well, let's not tell them what, because it says, at some point, do we over-articulate ourselves and then constrain the, the actual solution rather than really ask the question. I think we got to be better at stating what the problem is and letting them come with solutions rather than constraining the solution from the outset. Um, we're not going to fix the money thing easily. <laughs> not sure. Um, that's a whole different discussion panel. But, you know, the space station as a national lab, what it did is it said, if you can find funding by hook or by crook, however, you can bring that yeah. forward to CASIS and you can fly it in space. So it made space research be just like research in your own lab, only further and maybe a little more challenging, but it opened it up. So you didn't have to go to only one route. You can, you can appeal to an NIH mission or you can appeal to a NASA mission or a commercial um, a commercialization goal or, or a product goal, and all of those things find their way forward, which I think allows an innovative space that wouldn't be there if any one agency was controlling all aspects of that, where then, then everyone would tune themselves to that one agency's approach, and we would be leaving a lot of things on the sides. And this way, a good idea with a dedicated person pitching it, repitching it, trying again in a different way, just like on Earth, we can have those ideas come forward and really be transformative. Please join me in thanking all of our panelists and also Liz Warren, who did an amazing amount of work behind the scenes to make this panel happen today. And thank you to all the panelists for being here. It was a great conversation. Thank you.